This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Thomas Tai. I'm the president and CEO of Direct Relief International, and it is my thank you. <laughs> um, it's our pleasure at Direct Relief to co-host tonight's event with the UC Haiti Initiative, which you'll hear a little bit about in a minute. Um, my first task is to introduce a very important person to give a very important award to the UC Haiti Initiative. So I'd like to introduce to all of you Dr. Dr. Katya Armistead, Associate Dean of Students and Organization of Student Life uh, Director, who is here representing the Chancellor, who couldn't make it, and she will be presenting an award to Sierra Griffin from the UC Haiti Initiative, who is a fourth year global studies student and a really cool young woman. So Dr. Armistead, come on out and give the award. Good evening, everybody. It's so good to see you all. Thank you for coming out. Um, first of all, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the UC Haiti Initiative. And um, I'm so proud because uh, this is the birthplace of this initiative. And um, the likes of our, uh, one of our associated students, Vice President Chloe Stryker and Adam Goldman, and the Associated Students Legislative Council, the Human Rights Board, and the Environmental Affairs Board, they all came together and they managed to raise over $50,000 um, in just under about three weeks to support the efforts in Haiti after the devastating earthquake in 2010. I was so impressed. I work really closely with student organizations. I work with the leaders. It's one of the great parts of my job as being director of Office of Student Life. And so I get to see these things just grow and blossom. And I was so impressed with our UCSB students um, that I recommended to the chancellor that we nominate them for the President's Award, the President's as in President Udoff of the UC system, which is a very prestigious award. So, I suggested that we recommend them, and um, he agreed, and we put forth their name. Um, I interviewed Sierra Griffin and uh, had her tell me more about the organization, and, um, and it turned out that we weren't the only campus to nominate the UC Haiti Initiative. Um, there was other campuses. Uh, the chancellors at UC Berkeley, UCLA, and UC Riverside also nominated the UC Haiti Initiative for this award. And so I believe that President Udoff was just so impressed that he went ahead and selected the UC Haiti Initiative for this president's award. So that was really exciting. Um, through the efforts of UC Berkeley, UC Los Angeles, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Francisco, um, they managed to raise a whole heck of a lot of money for UC or for Haiti, and now there's a chapter on every UC campus for the initiative, and that's pretty darn exciting. Um, this award recognizes the extraordinary work that our students across the system. Um, and it really advances the university's mission of teaching, research, and public service. So that's why I believe that it was selected. So it is my great honor to formally recognize UCSB's chapter for the UC Haiti Initiative and present this beautiful plaque to the current chapter president, Sierra Griffin. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, this plaque, we had to figure out where to put it. And I wanted to make sure that uh, the, the campus community would actually be able to see it. And um, our building, the Student Resource Building, also fondly called the SRB, I thought would be the perfect place because a lot of students, staff, and faculty visit the SRB. And I wanted to protect it, though. So I've been fretting over this for a little while <laughs> on where I could place it where it was well protected. So our uh, front office, the Office of Student Life, um, it has these roll, this roll-down front desk. And so when it's open during the day, it's wide open, and you can see this wall right through the door, it's all glass, and so I'm going to prominently place it right on that wall um, to inspire other organizations to do such great things. So congratulations, and um, this is a beautiful award, isn't it? So now I think I turn it back to Thomas. Yes, I do, to continue the evening. Thank you. Doctor, good job. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sierra Griffin. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Sierra. I direct the chapter of the UC Haiti Initiative here on campus. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank Katya um, for initially nominating us for this award. Uh, her support and her um, encouragement has meant so much to us and really helped legitimize our organization. Um, I'd also like to thank Chancellor Yang for his official nomination, uh, Vice Chancellor Michael Young, Professor of Black Studies Chris McCauley for advising us. Um, personally, I'd like to thank Nicolas Pascal, who is our, um, <laughs> he's our uh, steering committee chair and UCHI co-founder. He's also a UCSB alum, um, and he is a great visionary for the uh, UC Haiti Initiative. Um, with that said, <laughs> I just want to take a few minutes to talk about the UC Haiti Initiative. Um, and I just want to say that, uh, yes, we are a group with great intentions, um, and that, that's an awesome thing, but that'll only take you so far. And I think that what sets us apart is that we are a group of great intentions. However, we've made a f steps to become effective and active um, in forming this collaboration with Haitians. And I think that's basically what distinguishes us as a group. Um, and of course, it, we can't do it up without the help of all the faculty and the staff and of course the students. So I just wanna thank you all um, for your participation and for coming here tonight. So um, I can't tell you how much it means for you all to be here in support of not only the UC Haiti Initiative, Direct Relief International, um, but also the Haitians that are involved with our partnership. So yeah, thank you so much. Oh, and can I make one quick? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> also, if you're here um, getting extra credit for one of your classes, there's going to be tables out in the back after the event that you can sign your name on, and we'll make sure that your professor gets your name. So, yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Congratulations. Way to go. Thank you, Sierra. I'd like to, um, you know, UCSB, you may not know this, it has a lot of cool things, but the there's one. Um, peer-reviewed Journal of Haitian Studies in the history of the world. And that uh, Journal of Haitian Studies happens to be right here at UCSB. And the editor of the only Journal of Haitian Studies in the history of the world is also here. And that person is Dr. Uh, Claudine Michel. And um, <laughs> who's now the Assistant Vice Chancellor of um, Student life, uh, student affairs, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, you know, for those of you who wouldn't know this, uh, Dr. Michelle and her colleague, uh, Dr. N uh, Nadej Cloton, also, both of them from Haiti, have, were really the spark be that put the UC Haiti initiative together. They have given tremendously good advice to direct relief. They plugged us in and allowed us to be proper trustees of the money that we were receiving after Haiti. And I also want to say that the late professor, Clyde Woods, uh, was just an amazingly dedicated man who was deeply involved in this whole effort. So although it is now largely student run and it approaches all campuses, my head is off. And the deepest thanks to you, Claudine, and your colleagues for getting it going. Way to go.
So I'll, I'll get off in a minute and get the, the real stars of the show on here, but um, you have the treat of having a person who's going to moderate this discussion before the film tonight, who is an exceptionally uh, an exceptional person who's had an exceptional career that is probably, after you hear about it, you're going to think, that is the coolest life of ever. Um, I don't know who else would, certainly not me or anyone I've ever met, if you try to think of uh, who Bill Gates would call for advice on philanthropy, or who someone named Buffett would call for advice on philanthropy, who does Bono call when he wants advice about philanthropy? They call Trevor Nielsen. Uh, so does Sir Richard Branson. That's just pretty cool, you gotta admit. So Trevor has had a, uh, really paved the way for how to in encourage high net worth people who wanna contribute philanthropically, celebrities who really have a disproportionate amount of attention in our society. Um, they could do something really crazy if they didn't talk to someone like Trevor. So if you see any celebrity ever doing something crazy, they did not call Trevor Nielsen, okay? Um, the very thoughtful people uh, in companies and in entertainment have had the good sense to do it. So it is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you your moderator for tonight, Mr. Trevor Nielsen. Thank, Thank you. you. Very, very sweet of you. Yeah. Thank you. Why don't you guys come on out? Good evening, everyone. I thought I'd bring my co-conspirators out on the stage right away and just get, get right to it. Thank you all so much for coming here tonight, and thank you for that warm introduction. We're just thrilled to be here and, and really appreciate the hospitality of DRI and Thomas and Raisa and, and Brett and everybody who's here tonight and our panelists. We're going to get into some really sticky issues tonight. Haiti is not a simple place, and it's not a place where you're going to find a lot of clarity when you look at what's happening there. And I think that you're in store for something really exciting in this film. Let me first introduce our, our panel tonight. <clears throat> first, we have Brett Williams. Brett is the Director of International Programs and Emergency Preparedness and Response for Direct Relief. Over the past six years, Mr. Williams, Mr. Williams has led emergency response efforts in some of the largest natural disasters in the world, including the Asian tsunami, Hurricane Katrina, the 2005 Pakistan earthquake and the Haiti earthquake in 2010. He's an expert in supply chain, inventory management, and distribution of medical commodities in emergency settings, having worked with the largest global healthcare companies and various UN and national governments in times of crisis. He sits on the Business Utilities Operations Center for the California Emergency Management Agency, tasked with coordinating all medical donations for the state of California during a major emergency. So he's a good guy to know. <laughs> Second, we have Bryn Mooser. Bryn is a buddy of mine. He's a filmmaker. He's the Haiti Country Director for Artists for Peace and Justice and co-founded a new media property called Riot.org, R-Y-O-T.org. Bryn spends part of his time working in Haiti building schools and cholera centers. He recently helped build APJ's secondary school in Port-au-Prince, the only free secondary school serving the poorest areas of Haiti. Before working in Haiti, Mr. Mooser, Mr. Mooser. Thank you served in the Peace Corps in West Africa for three years. Thank you, Bryn, for joining us. Thank you, Verity. And then finally, last but not least, Andrew McCullough. Andrew has been working with groups such as the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, the Pan American Health Organization, and Haiti's Ministry of Public Health, in addition to numerous in-country health providers and partners since 2010 to coordinate efforts in response to the ongoing cholera outbreaks in Haiti. Over the past two years, DRI has provided life-saving medications and supplies valued at over $86 million and continues to provide for 115 hospitals and clinics across Haiti. I've only recently really begun to understand what DRI does, and I have just been absolutely blown away, blown away every time I learn more about this organization. So let's get right to it. I think that most of you know that Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. More than half of its population lives on less than a dollar a day. It has the highest prevalence of HIV AIDS outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's a country that has a lot of problems. But at the same time, it was the first colony in the Americas to gain its freedom with a famous slave revolt. And there's a sense of optimism in Haiti that you can't deny. If you meet a Haitian person really anywhere in the world, you feel this optimism. But if you spend time in Haiti, you really see it, see it in an intense way. 
On January 12, 2010, a horrific magnitude 7.0 earthquake struck Haiti, 15 miles west of the capital of Port-au-Prince. And in 25 seconds, an entire nation that was already struggling was basically destroyed. There's a, a really conflict, complex set of factors that's at play in Haiti. Uh, the film is going to deal with some of those factors. But let me just begin by asking the panel, you know, um, and maybe Bryn. Bryn, how did you first get involved in Haiti? What drew you to this topic initially? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, everybody, for having us here. Uh, I first got involved in Haiti in 2008, and I went down with a filmmaker, Paul Haggis, who directed uh, Crash and um, wrote Million Dollar Baby. Uh, and we went down with a group of uh, actors from, from Los Angeles who became the founders of Artists for Peace and Justice. So it was Josh Brolin and Diane Lane and, um, and some others. And we had gone down because we had heard about um, somebody that we all know now, which is a, a, a doctor, a social worker, and a priest named Father Rick Frechette, who um, runs a very impressive um, local uh, uh, nonprofit down there called the St. Luke Foundation. So we had gone down to see him, and um, it was like you say about Haiti, it was one of those places where I got off the plane and was immediately fell in love with the place. Um, went down just for a week and came back and said, what else can I do for it? We started to do some fundraising. When the earthquake happened, um, Paul asked me if I wanted to go down, and you actually asked me if I wanted to go down um, to help set up the school for three months. Um, and I jumped at it since I had built schools in, in Africa and West Africa before, which has a very similar feeling, actually. Um, and then that three months became almost three years. And so that's how I got involved. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. Um, <laughs> funny enough, actually, the paths uh, crossed early on. I obviously, you've all figured out that I'm not Haitian and I'm actually from Santa Barbara, work at Direct Relief. And we, as an organization, were trying to figure out how to support local health care providers throughout the country. The organization has been working with hospitals and clinics since 1964 in Haiti, and actually in 2008, there were three major hurricanes that flooded the city of Go Naive. And in 2009, as an organization, we decided, let's create a hurricane preparedness program, uh, much like we had in the US, to take care of some of our friends and colleagues and partners down in the Caribbean. So we took a trip to Haiti in 2009, and we met Father Rick Frechette, which is funny enough, um, at St. Luke and St. Damien Pediatric Children's Hospital. And I'll never forget, I, Haiti has a lot of NGOs that work there, um, a lot that are doing incredible work, and he is one of the top people that I've ever met and ever worked with. And I think what I remember the most is when we came to him and said, can we, can we partner together? Can we create a hurricane preparedness program? And he said, um, maybe. Who are you? And we said, uh, well, we're trying to give you free medicines and medical supplies to help out. And he's like, yeah, a lot of people come down here and say they're going to do this and they're going to do that. But we convinced him over a couple months. And luckily, 2009 didn't have any hurricanes. But January 12, 2010, there was a major earthquake. And they had the supplies that we had pre-positioned. And they were able to immediately respond. Since then, I mean, personally, my life has changed. We've been working there for three years straight, essentially, and our organization has been focused on supporting health care organizations across the country. And Andrew, how did you first get involved? Uh, I had actually been getting a master's degree in Australia when the earthquake hit in Haiti, and I had previously been working for Direct Relief, and uh, they asked me to go down to help set up a in-country warehouse distribution center for the medicine and the medical supplies that we donate to hospitals in Haiti. And again, it's the same story. And it's the same story you hear from anyone that goes there. It's You're struck by the people there and their resourcefulness and their kind of never give up attitude. And you just want to do everything you can to help, you know, in any way you can. Not not you know, tell them what to do, but just help them do what they need to do. And in my you know, six week stint turned into three months and then it's now almost been three years. So I'm, uh, I'm stuck <laughs> in Haiti. What, so we're, we, everybody has a point of view that there's an optimism there and something really attractive about the people, but what, what's wrong with Haiti? Why, why is it so screwed up? Whose fault is it? That's a, that's a, do you want me to take that I one? was going to actually pass that to you, Brent. Thank you. Um, no, I think that's, 
that's one of the most sort of difficult and complex questions there is out there. I, I, personally, myself, I love history. I love puzzles. And one of the reasons I think I'm still in Haiti is that I, it, it's this incredible puzzle, you know? And it, it seems like it should be uh, quite easy to fix a lot of the problems. They're not easy, but at least attainable with all of the, the, the money and the resources. But you know, part of it is it's, or the greatest part of it, I think, is it has a long history of, of, uh, of, of from colonialism to uh, the, the US occupation that was there to um, you know, NGOs doing the wrong programs at the wrong time to broken promises with uh, you know, farm subsidies. I mean, there's, it's, had a lot of, it's had a lot of problems, and there's been a lot of outside forces that have uh, uh, rallied against it. Um, you know, being that first slave rebellion, I think, was difficult for a lot of people to accept. And certainly, there were embargoes from the beginning. So even as Haiti did get its earliest independence, and at that time was the richest of the colonies, um, it, it was never allowed to really flourish. So that's how what, it, what does that mean for an organization like DRI, all those factors at, at play? What, what, what opportunities or, or challenges does that present? Well, Direct Relief is, is primarily, like we've said, a support organization. So we try to find groups, in, in our case, it's local doctors and nurses who are in Haiti and doing, doing good work and treating patients um, in public hospitals or nonprofit hospitals, but don't have the resources to do the job that they need. Um, and that, uh, as Bryn uh, alluded to, was initially an embargo, so they couldn't get medicine and medical supplies into the country. Um, the government didn't have a functioning supply chain system for medications. And so what we're trying to do is just help them prop up that system so that we've identified quality people who are, who are seeing patients but just don't have the, the resources. And for us just to plug in is uh, where we see the fit. I think the challenge is you can quickly get overwhelmed with all the things that are needed in Haiti, I think. If you look at the health indicators, there's, they're the worst in the Western Hemisphere. They have incredibly talented people who really just need a few things to kind of get them over that hump. But for us, since there are so many things needed, we try to focus on healthcare. And within that, that's kind of the lens we look at Haiti with. And that's where we can make a difference as an organization, I think. That's how you kind of let the other noise go away and you focus on really plugging in resources. But there, there is such an incredible spirit and we keep meeting such incredibly talented people that it's, you know, it gets you, as they said, and then you just keep pushing on. I want to get right to the film, but is there, Bryn, in particular, is there anything that you would like to say about it before people watch it? Sure. Um, yeah, really briefly, thank you all so much for coming, by the way. It's a, it's a huge honor. And we have, um, who's the star of the film, uh, Mario Joseph, who came all the way from Haiti, who's in the front, who will be coming up after the film. So it's a real honor to have him uh, in the audience. But this is um, the film you're about to see, um, uh, Baseball in the Time of Cholera, is about uh, a little league baseball team that I had started. As Trevor said, my main job is to um, build schools there. So I built this secondary school. And as the school was being built um, about two years ago, on the land that we were building the school on, uh, we started to organize some of the kids who had lost their homes and many of their families who were the street kids who lived um, outside the school uh, into a baseball team. We had gotten you know, in the many containers that you guys ship down and everybody else ships down, somebody had put a bag in the back of it that had a little note that said, while you're doing all of the medical work, maybe you can have some fun. And it was a, it was a bag of baseball bats and gloves. And uh, so we started throwing the ball around. And um, it was about two years ago. And it was during that time that um, it was about the same time we started the team that cholera arrived in Haiti, um, which changed all of our lives up here. And we can talk about that a little more after the film. Um, so it's sort of, I was working in the cholera sector. We had built what became the largest cholera center. Um, at, you guys had probably had stocked up much of that cholera center. Um, we'll say yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was shooting a lot of that for my organization to sort of let donors know where their money was going. And I was also shooting a lot of the baseball team because I thought it would be an interesting story of, of kids finding hope through playing this game. Uh, and then, as you'll see, that's how I started the film. I won't give anything away, but that, that's a film. We will have more time to hear from, from uh, Bryn after. But I think with that, maybe, uh, Thomas, you're going to introduce somebody who's introducing the film? <laughs> the introduction to the introduction? Thank you, Trevor. No one noticed that at all. That was seamless. Um, 
I was so in, just enraptured by the speakers. Um, <laughs> and having been the former chief operating officer of the Peace Corps, I did not know that about our filmmaker. That's pretty cool. So is Nathan here? Oh, right behind me. Um, <laughs> Nathan, your job is to introduce the film. Nathan Siegel? Got that right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure. I know very little about Nathan Siegel. I do know, however, that he's cool. And I talked to him before the show here and assured him it would be going to be a Hollywood quality introduction so not to screw up at all. And he said, I'm cool. He had a tie on. He's a junior, I believe. And any junior who knows how to tie a tie that didn't go to prep school, is exceptionally bright, particularly here at UCSB. So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> to introduce the Tribeca Award-winning film, Baseball Time of Cholera, please welcome Nathan Siegel. Thank you, Thomas. That was the first introduction and probably the best I'll ever have. <laughs> it's a, it was a compliment. So thank you all for coming out tonight to what has already proved to be an incredible evening. Um, on behalf of UCHI and the entire UCSB community, I want to thank Thomas, my deep, express my deepest gratitude for Thomas for his continuing support and guidance. Um, as you all know, UCHI recently was awarded the Presidential Award for Excellence in Student Leadership. And Thomas, I can't re reiterate enough how essential Thomas has been for that success. So give him a round of applause. <laughs> Speaking, <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> Speaking of invaluable people, I want to recognize Nicolas Pascal, UCHI's co-founder, and Sierra Griffin, UCSB's chapter director for their invaluable work for this organization. So you can stand up. Come on. I want to really embarrass them, so. Looking, looking, looking stare, yeah. Those two are the heart and soul of this organization's chapter and have worked tirelessly and selflessly to bring you all here tonight, sacrificing completely their social lives. So for that, we thank you. Um, also, I would like to, I'd like, I'd like to say how honored we are to be partnering with Direct Relief International for this, to host this event. And despite their insistence and modesty, I would like to thank Raisa Smurl, Carrie Murray, Kelly Henderson, um, Eddie Mendoza, and all the DRI staff for making this event possible. So, thank you. And now that I've kissed everyone's ass, justifiably, justifiably, I'd like to introduce the man who is charged with bringing justice to the victims of cholera and their families. Mario Joseph has been practicing human rights and criminal law in Haiti since 1993. He has represented various political prisoners, has testified on Haitian criminal procedure and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, he has stood on the Haitian government's board for law reform, on the Law Reform Commission. In 2000, he spearheaded the prosecution for the Raboteau Massacre trial, one of the Western Hemisphere's most significant human rights cases. And New York Times has deemed him Haiti's most prominent human rights lawyer. And now, he is charged with holding the United Nations accountable for bringing cholera to Haiti in 2010. And after the film, uh, joining him for the Q&A session will be Brent Mooser, from who you've already heard. Unfortunately, the other filmmaker, David Darg, has not been able to make it, and he had to go back to Haiti, so duty calls, you know. But this film is quite remarkable, and at the Tribeca Film Festival, as Thomas has already said, and they won the award for the best documentary short, which is quite an achievement. And although this film eventually developed to address the issue of cholera, the greater issue of cholera, it began simply as a chronicle of a youth baseball team. Um, 
as the story itself unfolded, the purpose and focus of this film grew as well. And the result of this is a, is a story that's so personal, yet so ambitious and grand in its scope and claims. But Joseph's story is one of many, and this film speaks to the fact that uh, beneath the headlines and the statistics lay thousands of experiences just as personal and just as moving. As Nico often says, we have a lot to learn from Haiti and from Haitians themselves. So with this in mind, I'd like to present to you Baseball in the Time of Cholera. Thanks and enjoy. The death toll from a cholera outbreak in Haiti passed 200 tonight and thousands more are sick. Patients overwhelmed a hospital in the port city of St. Mark's seeking treatment. The source of the outbreak is not yet confirmed. I raced this guy up here and he just died now. As I came to the gate and they told him no. Reports of new cases are emerging in towns 50 miles from the outbreak zone. Some reports say victims have died in as little as four hours. Health workers are rushing medication, clean water, and hygiene supplies to the affected region. This outbreak is likely to uh, get much larger. Tens of thousands of survivors of the devastating earthquake are vulnerable. They're still living in crowded tent cities in and around Port-au-Prince with poor sanitation and little access to clean drinking water. I make two people out, but so... I love my life. In the afternoon, I play baseball. In the morning, I go to school and photo prints. This is my house, and this is my garden, and this is my, where we live after the earthquake because our room was filled down. This is my father. And this is my last sister, Cindy. This is my sister, Lovely. And this is my brother, Pascal. And this is my sister, Geda. This is my mom. She makes beautiful jelly to spread our family. Sometimes we cook here, we make some food here. That is some kitchen for us. And this is our bathroom. So. Hey, look, this is my baseball ball. And this is my favorite thing. I got this when I went to Toronto, I love it.
I wear this in my house because I love my life. We have these posters. They teach you how to then get cholera. Watch your hand. Drink clean water. Watch all the things before it. Put the purple on Latin only. Sometimes this one make it very hot. A lot of mysticals here. <laughs> A lot of mysticals. Eleven people live in this house with me. It's Haiti's nightmare scenario, an outbreak of deadly disease killing scores in a country already on its knees. Authorities say the symptoms, acute diarrhea, vomiting, and dehydration, bear all the hallmarks of cholera. Her, her husband died last night, and this is her daughter. We're just getting her on an IV, and then we're, we're going to the You can imagine the desperation was because no one knew what this was. Everyone was saying that the river was poisonous. Don't go near the river. Something happened, was coming upstream from upstream here and now it's reaching other results from what we can tell. Unlike HIV, which is a very slow killer, this was killing people instantly. Fear uh, existed, a lot of fear and anxiety around, around the causes. The most kind of vivid memories are just everyone trying to find water and not wanting to, to drink the river water that was on the side. People were so desperate for getting clean water. It, 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 it got me, it really got me. And I think what got me the most was the fear. It started to rain, and that's when it really hit me. And I said, wow, we, you know, we're in for a long haul here, and we were just going to continue to see cases until we were able to identify what the cause was. Right from that initial night where we saw 400 patients and then the next day had over 1,000, that this couldn't just be your, your run-of-the-mill diarrhea, that it looked, you know, it had the, the telltale signs of cholera. If someone is with cholera is defecating and, and it somehow gets into a river system, it's easily able to then be transmitted quickly. The Artimony River is the largest river in Haiti, but it's also the breadbasket where most people are, are living off the land farming. They're not just drinking the water, they're bathing in the water, they're using it for their crops, they're bathing their animals in the water, they're, they might be even defecating in the water. And so it's, it's this vicious cycle. As the disease spreads from the town of St. Mark, cases are now being reported in the capital of Port-au-Prince. We built this field. We are the first little league in Haiti. And we get better every day. That's Jeff. That's Buki. That's crazy. That's Jaffney. Sometimes baseball is crazy. 
Sometimes it's hard, but we love it. We play in the sun, and we play in the wind. That's Jason. We thought it's our culture. That she love, he love baseball. One day I want to play baseball in the major league. UN soldiers working furiously to contain what looks like a sewage spill at this base in Haiti's rural heartland. We came here after rumors that Nepalese troops could be a source for the cholera outbreak. The disease is waterborne and untreated waste running into a river is a big danger and that's exactly what we found. Well, we're not being told exactly what's going on here, but it certainly smells like sewage. There are toilets right there, and the liquid seems to be draining into this river just a few meters away that flows into the nearby town of Mirbalé. The Nepalese contingents wouldn't tell us when they arrived here, but UN headquarters confirmed it was mid-October, just weeks after a cholera outbreak in Kathmandu. A lawsuit's been filed on behalf of more than 5,000 Haitians against the United Nations over the cholera outbreak that has further devastated Haiti in the aftermath of the January 2010 earthquake. It's widely believed the cholera was brought to Haiti by a battalion of Nepalese troops with the UN peacekeeping force. The strain of cholera that hit that area is, is identical to a strain that was in Nepal, and Nepal had a, had a cholera outbreak in the summer of 2010. With more than 5% of the population sickened during the outbreak, it's believed Haiti now has the highest rate of cholera in the world. Brian Kincannon is one of the attorneys who filed the suit on behalf of Haitian cholera victims. Uh, we're, we're hoping that this is the case that's too big to fail, that the, the, the evidence against the United Nations is, is so overwhelming here that, that the UN will have no choice but to finally take responsibility for its malfeasance. <laughs> I'm now in Sema. I'm working with some a group of human rights to ask for justice and reparation for the victims of cholera. The victims who have been killed, the victims who have been injured. When we heard about the, 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 the breakout of the cholera, we make some investigation, we document that. We visit all sites, all uh, uh, areas where the cholera, we got a break out of cholera. We looking with, for people who have been sick or killed by the cholera. We talk to them, to the family. It's the, he has, his father was being killed on cholera. And then uh, when we make the fire for people, he said the line is too long. He can wait. And now Adam, I'm, I give him the phone of our lawyers in Semak uh, to come to him and make the file for him. We got tuberculosis, we got malaria, but we never have a, a, a cholera. But it's, it's evident that the minister or the Nepalese bring it.
in Haiti, to the, in the, this river. Shots ring out on the streets of Haiti as anger over a horrific outbreak of cholera reaches boiling point. Locals blame the UN troops like these Nepalese soldiers for the outbreak. Demonstrations have seen crowds take to the streets using burning tires as roadblocks. In the northern port city of Cap Haitien, two people were killed when UN soldiers exchanged gunfire with protesters. Others have been hurt in similar shows of anger around the Caribbean island. The thought that the very foreign visitors who were supposed to be helping Haitians may have brought this affliction to the island is almost too painful to contemplate. In Cape Haitian, we are in the country, we got the resistance of people who, who, ask, who ask the minister to out the country. Abba is against. When you say Abba, Abba you, I'm against you. Abba ministers mean against minister. Minister brought us cholera. He never brought the peace in Haiti. They call a peacekeeper. They don't bring the peace. There's been slow funding for cholera treatment. There has not been slow funding for peacekeeping. Uh, One-tenth of all UN peacekeepers are in Haiti. They, their budget for this year is $800 million, and that's for a country that has not had a war in, in my lifetime but does have a cholera epidemic. The U.S. nation have their own protocol how to respect the environment rights of any country they send the peacekeeper. But why they don't detect the cholera on the uh, Nepalese soldiers, or how they don't treat the, 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 you know, the waste. They need to say, it's, um, it's my fault. Let's uh, help the Asian government to eradicate the cholera. And they continue to deny, and the, the disease continue to spread around the country. We need to say, hey, to the United States nation, you promote the human right. Let's down the human rights in Haiti. Let's let the Haitian people to drink some potable water. Cholera came. Haiti have a lot of trouble, but other countries have trouble too. With tsunami relief on their minds, kids in Dallas squeeze the aid from lemons, a lemonade fundraiser for Japan. In an hour, they raise more than $1,000. From Haiti, Joseph and Jeffrey look at Japan and see themselves. Their 14-year-olds still living in tents after last year's earthquake. For me, it's not, it's not easy. It's good. So, thank you. In their despair, they link to Japan with plastic scraps made into bracelets. $10 a piece, $200 so far. Moved, like all these kids, to send hope in whatever way they can. Some people saw me on TV and invited me to Toronto to meet Blue Jay. the city. We work everywhere. It's different from Haiti. No earthquakes, no riots, no cholera.
I miss my mom, but got to call her on the phone at the game. Salut to Union Melody. Salut to Union Netakala. Salut Baba Melody, to Team Union Net. Salut to the pays à faire fret. Elle fait fret. Je vais me faire fret là en ville là. My father called me and said, Joseph, your, fa your mother of cholera. You don't think what we can do if you have friends to have car to bring her to the hospital? And I say no. Then they take a motorcycle. Then they go with her. And tomorrow morning, I go to see her. She was very good. Then She's, she worked very hard for us. And then she was love us very much. She will stay in my heart forever. We will fight for the right of poor people, fight for the right, fight to change this unjust system. I'm not afraid. We said in Haiti, victoire c'est pour peuple. The victory is for poor, is for, for the people. We believe on that. All the time, the, the people in Haiti has the, the victory. We got a victory in 1803, and a huge, a big army from France, the Napoleon army, we got the victory. 
we defeat a lot of dictatorship like Duvalier, I think the victory is on our side. But we need to keep going and make the struggle and make the fight. I'm really confident we'll win this process. And, and then, not only for Haiti, not for Haiti, this will be for the for the poor country. It's a fight of the world. I'm walking around the country on Poirea and looking to the people who have been infected or, or been killed or have the disease of cholera. And keep him working until I find the last victims of cholera.